Okay, good morning. Uh, so, is the microphone working? We can, or is it? Okay, so, so I want to start today with the topic of the rate of escape and specifically the current Veropoulos bound. So let me remind you what it says. It says that in the reversible Markov chain, we have, okay, don't need the two if I write probability of st bigger than the distance to y, and this in turn will be bounded by twice. <coughs> right, so we're going to focus on the first, since the second is a standard turn of bound you get just from uh, uh, looking at the expectation expanding the moment generating function. Okay, so we're going to focus on that. <laughs> and uh, so the <coughs> so in the proof I'm going to focus now on the k in the just to simplify notation. Um, so okay so uh, we'll do two reductions. So one is although this applies both to finite and countable chains, it's easy to reduce to the finite uh, case because, <coughs> okay, my graphs will be, to have simple random walk uh, defined, we would want bound, uh, the graph to be locally finite. And in general, this is not just simple random walk, but we're going to, this can be, this assumption can be removed, but we're going to, Assume that the graph, that the graph G, which of allowed transitions, is locally finite. So every vertex is of finite degree. It may be unbounded, but it's finite. Um, this can be removed, but all, most all examples we care about are locally finite. Then, <coughs> so if we assume that, then we can we see that within distance t from x, there are only finitely many vertices. And uh, so it doesn't matter if we think of the whole infinite graph or just of the finite graph, um, which is the t neighborhood of x, because uh, the graph vertices further away play no role in, uh, the prob in going from x to y in, in t steps. So we, we, so we can reduce to the case to, uh, to a finite state space. So then uh, P is just a finite matrix. Now there is something I'm going to do, ass assume now, and we're going to generalize later, assume now that uh, pi is uniform on the state space. And uh, we'll dis discuss the generalization later, but this just allows us to focus on the key things. The so, of course, if we have a regular graph, then pi is uniform, if it's simple random walk in the regular graph, and the examples of uh, symmetric walks on Cayley graphs, also pi is uniform. So those are some of the key examples. So, and then this, of course, has a simpler form, so this factor is not there. <coughs> uh, so we're going to need some basic facts about Chebyshev polynomials. We want to emphasize how uh, this proof is both elementary and a bit mysterious. So I'm going to uh, prove everything we need about Chebyshev polynomials, which is very basic. So um, if we look at, so Chebyshev polynomials arise from looking at the 
a cosine function. So maybe a good starting point is the identity that the cosine of k theta is a, 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 if you multiply that by cosine theta, this is a cosine of k plus 1 theta plus cosine um, of k minus 1 theta, and there's a 2 missing somewhere. So So you are all closer to high school than, or almost all are closer to high school than I am. So, uh, OK, maybe one exception. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you should remember this uh, better than me. Now, the way we're going to use it is, so the Chebyshev polynomial is defined by cosine of k theta is um, so I'm going to write Q. <coughs> Usually they're denoted by either TK or QK. I'll write QK of cosine theta. And this identifies the polynomials QK. So in particular, uh, Q0 is just identically 1. And write Q1 of z is, is just z. So I'm going to use z for cosine theta, although so z is <laughs> going to be real. It won't be complex. It just be, will be standing for cosine theta. So q2 of z is, of course, 2z squared. And in general, a qk of z, so for any k positive, qk of z is a is a polynomial of degree k. To the squared minus one. To the squared minus one. Thank you. A polynomial thank you. So right so already the case of uh, to the squared minus one you already obtained from this identity. And in general, the identity allows you to verify this by induction because here is a, right here is Q. So if z is cosine theta, then this is uh, qk plus 1 of z. And by induction, this is degree k minus 1 polynomial in z. And this is degree, right, this is qk of z. And you multiply by, by 2z and subtract the other one. So by induction, we see this fact. And you also see that the, the, the leading fact, uh, coefficient is the power of 2. We don't care about that. We do care a lot that it's exactly degree k, <coughs> which we see from this identity. Okay. Now the other fact <laughs> we need about Chebyshev polynomials is a consequence of the binomial theorem. Namely, if you take. Um, so write z, again, z is cosine theta. And then let's write what z to the k is, um, or z to the t. So t uh, will be a large integer corresponding to the time we care about. So let's write this as e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2 to the t. Now, this, of course, we can expand using uh, binomial expansion. And what we will get, and I want to write, instead of writing the binomial coefficients, I want to write it directly in terms of simple random walk. And it's just this. So it's the probability that um, st equals k, sum from uh, k, which is you know, minus t to t, times uh, e to the i k theta. Because, of course, you can get this for binomial expansion. But also, very pictorially, if you just write uh, t factors like this, right, uh, one after the other, 
then and you want to multiply them out, well, in the product, you have to each time choose, am I going to take e to the plus i theta or e to the minus i theta? So this corresponds to the steps of the walk. So you have t, t factors, so it corresponds to t steps. And if you chose, um, so, so you, you chose some pluses and some minuses, you add them up, and that will mean uh, that you will get a factor e to the i k theta. And the number of choices that will lead to e to the i k theta is exactly uh, the number of choices to make st equals k. And the normalization here you get from the two exactly corresponds to the one for walk. So uh, you can see it kind of by hand or just use the binomial expansion. Now, <laughs> let's take real part so of, of both sides here. So when I take, so z is itself real, so taking real part doesn't change anything. Uh, so this must equal, this whole sum must equal to its real part. And, uh, and that is just sum probability, sum over k, probability of st equals k, uh, cosine k theta. So because cosine is an even function, it will be convenient to define also q minus k for negative things will just be defined to be qk. So this is just for convenience. So it's still uh, consistent with the qk of z, qk of cosine theta equal cosine k theta. That's also true for, I want it also to be true for negative k, so that's fine. Okay, so we have this identity, which now we can write, let's eliminate theta and write it in terms of z. So, uh, so z to the t equals sum over k, probability of st equals k times a qk of z. Okay, so this is now a, an identity of polynomials z to the t, uh, pure power of uh, degree t, equals the sum of polynomials of degree k with these coefficients coming from the random walk. Okay, now if we have an identity of polynomials, we can plug in any matrix we want into the identity because you know, powers of the matrix also commute with each other. So this implies that so we want to take the so p is the transition matrix of the walk the finite matrix so p to the t equals the sum of p pro p zero s sum over k p zero of s t equals k q k of z this is now an identity of two matrices okay again. This proof is supposed to be transparent, so uh, if there's something confusing, please Q stop me. QK of P. Good. All right. So this is an identity of two matrices. And let's uh, look at a particular entry. What entry do we care about? P, uh, the entry of at location x, y of this. Right, so x is, one ent x is the starting point, y is some target. And again, QK of P is a matrix, and we take the, the XY entry of this matrix. Okay, so if two matrices are the same, also the XY entry is the same. Okay, now remember that QK of P is a, a so QK is a polynomial of degree K. So, so in this sum, suppose X and Y have distance 10 and they look at k equals 7, what can you say about qkp of x, y? It's zero. it's zero. Because, right, so obviously for k less than the distance of x, y, <coughs> you know, p to the k, x, y is zero, and all lower powers also are zero, so qkp, QK of P is just a combination of this for K and for lower degrees. So QKP of XY is also zero for K less than the distance. So in this sum, we could just sum over K, which is at least the distance 
from x, y. What minus Thank you. Absolute value of k is at least the distance from x, y, uh, p0, st equals k. Yeah, so there's the positive and the negatives, and they just, uh, we, uh, we can write this this way or just take a factor of 2 and write for both. But I'll do it this way. So sum over all k so that absolute value of k of distance of x, y, probability of st equals k. And here we have a qkp of x, y. OK, so now we want to say something about these terms when k is uh, bigger than the distance of x, y. So what can you tell me about the eigenvalues of p? In what interval are they sitting? P is a Markov transition matrix. Where are they? Minus 1, 1. So Right, so lambda is in minus 1, 1. So what are the eigenvalues of uh, qk of p? They just have the form qk of lambda, where lambda is a eigenvalue of p. And here we're in a very simple situation. Remember, we assumed that the pi is uniform. And when I stated the theorem yesterday, I assumed that it's a reversible Markov chain. So what this means is we are assuming now that because pi is uniform, p is symmetric. pxy is pyx. Right? The generalization is p is self-adjoint with respect to pi. P is a self-adjoint operator in L2 of pi. But now we are pi is uniform, so p is just a symmetric matrix. So it can be diagonalized. And so in the, in the right basis, p just looks like a, right, p is a unitarily equivalent to this diagonal uh, matrix. And so if you take a diagonal matrix, so if you work in that basis and you apply a polynomial like qk, then if you apply it to a diagonal matrix, what will happen? You'll just get qk of lambda 1, qk of lambda 2, and so on in the uh, diagonal. And you can do all this in this uh, basis of eigenvectors. So the eigenvectors are the same. The eigenvalues are mapped with the polynomial. Okay, so in general spectral theory, this is uh, sometimes called functional calculus. Here we're working with matrices. Everything is very simple and elementary. So these are the eigenvalues. Uh, what can you tell me about where they are sitting? So when lambda is in minus 1, so this is a polynomial. If you look at this polynomial, like 2z squared minus 1, where does it map minus 1, 1, 2? I want to bound how big could this be. Minus 1, 1. Bec uh, but if you write down these polynomials, it's not so obvious from their formula. Well, for 2z squared minus 1, it's still obvious. But if I write you know, q10, some big polynomial, it's not obvious. If you go back to the definition, if lambda is in minus 1, 1, it is cosine theta for some theta. And qk of cosine theta is another cosine of something else. So it's certainly in minus 1, 1. Okay? So this is, <laughs> so <laughs> we're using only two things about the Chebyshev polynomials, really, okay, or three things. One is they're exactly degree k. The second is this binomial identity that we have here. And the third is that it maps minus 1, 1, 2. So so this is also in minus 1, 1. And because it's a symmetric matrix, the largest eigenvalue is, in absolute value, is the norm of the matrix. So, so it means the, this matrix has norm at most 1. In fact, 1. So, so if I look at the matrix QK of P, if I look at any entry of that, this is just multiplying this matrix by two unit vectors, right? The unit vector, which is uh, Dirac at x, and the unit vector is Dirac at y. I multiply by one on the left, one on the right. These are both unit vectors in, in L2. Of, so, so it means that this number is always at most one. 
because I just took a matrix of norm one and multiplied it by two, uh, ve on the left and the right, by two vectors of norm one. In this is just in little l2 with no weights now, so of, of you, uh, okay? So, okay, so, so now uh, we're done because uh, now let's take, so, so this is a positive number, right? This is a positive number, so I can put absolute value here. Put absolute value here. And then this is less than, well, all these numbers are at most one, so it's less than sum over k, absolute value k bigger than dxy, p0 st equals k, But if you look, this is exactly this probability, right? Probability that st is bigger than the distance. <coughs> if you just write it out as a sum, it's exactly the sum we have written there. So that's the whole proof. <laughs> Questions? Yes? What will change if you will allow the Pi. Uh, very little. So in that case, uh, okay, so QK is still a norm one operator. So, so for general pi, so the norm of QK of P, so that argument still works, but everything now you have to work really in L2 of pi. So P is a self adjoint operator in the scalar product given by with weights pi. So this norm is still one because it's still true that for a self-adjoint operator, its norm is uh, given by the largest eigenvalue. Uh, and now, but, but if you look at the, you know, the Dirac measure at x, if you want to compute its norm, so now the norm is in L2 of pi, right? So the norm squared is just pi of x, because you have this weight, pi. So, Right, so then um, the, if you look at the, um, uh, if you want to understand what QKP of XY is, well, it's no longer, a, so we, w we wanted to say before that it's just taking um, delta x and multiplying by qk of p. So this is the vector which is Dirac at x, so it's 1 at x and 0 everywhere else. And so before we had this, this thing, but, but now because we're doing scalar product with respect to pi, when we take the inner product, we have this extra pi of x, right? So, so now the correct identity is pi of x times this equals this inner product. Okay, now we can still use Cauchy-Schwarz. To bound this above by the norm of delta x times the norm of the operator, which is at most one, times the norm of delta y. And remember that all the no these norms are with respect to, a are in L2 of pi. So this is, this product is the square root of pi x, pi y. Okay, and now if you divide both sides by pi x, you'll get that factor root pi y over pi x. That's the whole change. All right, so now we have proof of this. So we have the diameter, diameter squared over log n, a lower bound for mixing time. Um, is one more exercise. Um, Take G and expander on N nodes. Maybe this will be G zero. 
an expander on n nodes, and uh, subdivide each edge n times. So each edge, I mean into n edges. OK, so you can think of subdivision or stretching. So we have this original expander. So, so G0 is, say, to be concrete, a three regular expander, or D, so bounded fixed degree expander. So, so the original graph is a three degree expander. And now we take every edge and expand it. OK, so, so check that for this graph, uh, so so, uh, and this yields, yields a graph G. Uh, the, the resulting graph G has uh, about n squared nodes, or edge, because the original G0 had n, and every edge got expanded, uh, subdivided into n pieces, so we get n squared nodes in the resulting G. And then check that for this G, Indeed, it's true that the mixing time of G is up to constant. The diameter squared of G over log n. So this means up to some absolute constant. So you don't have to check the lower bound because we proved it holds for all graphs. Um, and I should say to avoid periodicity, so here I mean by T mix of G, I really mean of lazy, simple random walk on G. So we have a lower bound. And uh, for expanders, the mixing time is log n. And you can think, how much is the mixing slowed down by this subdivision? And you'll find that this is that. So if you have some verification to do. Um, but uh, so, th so this kind of bound is, is sharp. And it's a little surprising in the sense that initially, if you don't think carefully of examples, you might think that if a graph has polynomial growth, like this one, then the mixing time should be at least quadratic in the radius or in the diameter. But this shows that the mixing time can be a little faster than diameter squared, but not a lot faster at most log n. OK, um, so now any, any more questions? Or? So I want to illustrate another application of Oropoulos Karn in a different direction for, uh, for random walks on groups. Again, <coughs> this is. application to groups. So I'm going to present a classical argument going back to Kaimanovich, Vershik, and uh, Veropoulos. Uh, since Anna Urschler is here, I should mention there are a lot more sophisticated arguments of this type that, uh, that she and others have uh, generated. But uh, so, so the application to groups, we will be interested now in a uh, simple random walk on a Cayley graph. Of an infinite group G. So, but G is finitely generated by some finite set of generators S, which is symmetric. So with every generator, we also have the inverse. And then the, remember that the Cayley graph has a x, x a neighbor of y, if and only if, 
a x is in y times s. So this is the right Cayley graph, or the, and we're going to do the right random walk. Okay. We just have to make some choice. Okay, so um, so we connect two things if th they are obtained by multiplying by a generator, and then we have a simple random walk which just takes a group element and multiplies by a random generator. That would be simple random walk, and Everything can be done much more generally, but let's stick to the simplest example of simple random walk. And then uh, there's an equivalence of a, there are many interesting equivalences. The one I want to focus on involves speed and entropy. So, uh, so let me recall what is entropy. So for any measure mu, which is finite or countably supported, the entropy of mu is the sum over x. Right, and this is the sum over all x that have positive mass. So that's the entropy of a measure mu. And if we have a, if x is a random variable, then we will sometimes write h of x to mean h of the uh, distribution or the law of x. Okay, so this is just shorthand. Um, so we also need entropy of like a pair of random variables h, h, x, y, it's just defined um, as the entropy of the joint distribution, right? x, y is a, have a joint distribution, so this is just the entropy of, of that. Um, and so I, I'll write it in this abbreviated form. Right, so this is the joint distribution now mu of the two variables x, y. Um, similarly, you can define conditional entropy. So h of x given y is the sum over uh, x and y of So h of x given y so the <coughs> is, is not a random variable. This is actually already average. So this is a number obtained by summing a, maybe the probability of y equals little y <coughs> times if I condition on y to be equal little y, then I have some conditional distribution of x. And I just like look at the entropy of, of this. And one thing which is easy to verify from the formula, this is the same as the uh, entropy of the pair xy minus the entropy of y. This is some basic facts about entropy. Um, in particular, this difference is always non-negative. Because it's an average of these non-negative quantities. OK, so one way to measure the growth of a random walk on the group is to ask how far it is from the starting point. Another is to ask how spread out is the distribution. So, and that will be done using entropy. Maybe one more fact I want to point out is if mu is uh, supported on, on n points, then 
h of mu is at most log n. And of course, you have equality if mu is the uniform distribution. Um, and this is. Because if I write h of mu minus a some u of x log of n over okay so this is this is true because mu is a probability distribution, and then you can write this is less than the sum of, uh, use the fact that log, log of t is less than t minus 1, so n over mu x. <coughs> so, minus 1. Sorry, what? Uh, yeah. Log of one over n. What did I uh, do wrong? Yeah, log <coughs> h of mu minus. No. <laughs> Sorry. So, what I want to do is. Right, because this is a minus, thank you. Right, so I want to put them in, in the bottom. Right. And, uh, and since we're summing over n, over n things, this will be uh, 1 minus 1, which is 0. Thank you. OK, so. Okay, so one way to measure the spread of a random walk is to look at the entropy of Xn. So uh, one more remark we need is that the entropy of X, so if the Xn is the random walk on the group, then the entropy of X m plus n um, I want to bound it from above. So this is less than entropy of the pair, which I can write as the entropy of Xn plus the entropy of Xm plus n given Xn. But if I condition on where the, here now we want to use something about the group structure. So if I condition on where the random walk is at time n, xn, and then look at where is xn plus n, well, it's just multiplying. So xn plus n is just obtained by x from xn by multiplying by an independent copy of xm. Right? This is just because it's a random walk on the group. So this, ent so this is the same as the entropy of xn plus the entropy of this independent copy. So if I know where I am at time n, the uncertainty about where I'll be at time n plus n is just the same as the uncertainty of xm. You easily see this formally for this identity. And so you get the subadditivity of entropy. So, so this means that there exists uh, the following limit, little h, which is defined as the limit of h of xm plus n 
divided by, I'm sorry, h of xn divided by n. Because for any subadditive sequence, um, this is a positive subadditive sequence, so always it's an elementary exercise that always, if subadditivity implies linear, uh, that this limit must exist. And this is uh, known as the asymptotic entropy or the Aves entropy of the random walk. Here, the h of xn is defined by starting from any vertex, and then... Uh, so, I, sorry, I didn't uh, specify. So, h of xn, the random walk, is defined by starting from the identity. So, xn is just... Sorry, I didn't say that. Yeah. So, um, right, so, xn can be written as, you know, the identity, which, of course, I could omit, times a product, you know, g1, g2, up to gn, where these have... Uh, the, these are, in our, in our case, these are... IID <coughs> uh, uniform on the generating set S. Okay, now, so that's one uh, important quantity, the asymptotic entropy or the best entropy. Another important quantity is, which is most natural for probabilists, is the rate of escape. So going to write xn as the distance as a distance from the identity to xn okay so this is the notation we'll use and then the uh, asymptotics uh, asymptotic speed is defined as the limit of, let's say, and again, this limit exists because, again, expectation of xm plus n is less than Just because of writing, again, the same formula, xm plus n as a product, like this, and using the triangle inequality. So, so there is this limit, which is uh, the, uh, the asymptotic speed. And here is the theorem we want to state, which is that the speed is positive if and only if the asymptotic entropy is positive. And we're going to make it more quantitative. So one direction here is uh, immediate for Cayley graphs, namely um, so if right, so if uh, the speed is zero, certainly the entropy will be zero. So this direction. This direction is easy. So let's write dn for the absolute value of for the absolute value of xn. Then h of xn is um, can be written as h of xn, okay, which is dn, uh, 
okay, all I need is the is the inequality, but in fact these are these are equal. Okay, now the distance in n steps is at most n, so so this is uh, at most n plus one possibilities for the distance. So this is most log of n plus one. Now what is the distance of x n? Uh, given dn, <coughs> so it's a probability that dn equals k times uh, the entropy of xn given that uh, the distance is k. But the distance k, how many vertices do we have? At most, size of s to the k. So, um, so we can bound by the log of the size of s to the k. So if we take h of xn over n, it's bounded by, um, so when we take the log here, We'll get, uh, we can get a, a log s term out. So if you, take, uh, if you take this log s out, what you get is the sum probability xn equals k times k, which is just the expected distance. So this is just going to give us the expected distance. And here we divide it by n, so we'll divide it by n. OK, so this immediately gives you the trivial direction. If the if the limit of this is positive, and of course the limit speed is positive. So, so this is easy. The other direction is not intuitively as clear because you, so, you, so in the other direction you assume you are zooming off at a positive speed, but why can't you be concentrated near some uh, location on some sub-exponential? So it says if you're moving fast, then you must be spread out. It's not obvious at all, but it is easy consequence from Veropoulos Karn. Maybe I can start here. So in the other direction, <coughs> we'll want an inequality bounding uh, the entropy from below. So let's write the entropy, so it's sum so it's probability starting, again I emphasize this, we start from the identity, xn equals x, log 1 over this probability, now we want to apply veropoulos karn here, and the key is to apply it only to one of the terms. So we're going to keep this as is, but here we want to apply veropoulos karn So so this is bigger than, okay, we have the sum over x. E. And then so Verpulus Khan gives us a upper bound on the probability, so it's a lower bound on this on this log. And what is the lower bound? Um, so we get a distance squared from e to xn divided by the time, which was n, 2n, minus log 2. Right? So this is just using Pn Ex is at most 2 e to the minus d squared xy over 2n. Right? So a d squared of Ex. Right? So we just took this, took logarithms, um, or took 1 over and took logarithms, and we get, we get this. 
Okay. Everyone agree? Okay. Now, but what is this? What we got here is that the so entropy of Xn is at least so let's see I had uh, the two n so this is expected <coughs> this is expectation of the distance squared so I can write this as absolute value of Xn squared. divided by 2n minus log 2. Which, you, of course, using Cauchy-Schwartz, I can use the expectation of absolute value of xn, quantity squared, divided by 2n minus log 2. OK, now you see, so. So the direction we're proving now is that if the if the speed is positive, right, if the limit of so okay, let's divide by n. So x h x n over n is bigger than e x n over n squared minus log two over n. Okay, so now it's clear if this if this has a positive limit. Right? This will be the speed. So let's you take a limit in, in these inequalities. We get that the entropy is bigger than the asymptotic speed squared. And I was omitting some 2 over 2. OK? So this proves the other inequality. So if the walk moves fast, it has to spread out. Um, one other consequence that's worth pointing out of uh, Varopoulos' Karn is that, um, so any, any questions or comments on this? So one other corollary is if a graph G has a polynomial growth, Meaning that if I look at the, at the ball in the standard graph metric, this is bounded by some constant r to some uh, to some power. Um, I'm out of, you know, what, say, to some power b. So this is true for for any r. If g has polynomial growth, then the um, walk can escape escape at most diffusively. So let's get it directly from this inequality we have here. <coughs> so the expected distance squared is at most in right, what we got from this inequality to
Okay, so we just, if we just take that identity and multiply by, uh, by 2n, so this is a linear term, and this is a term of order n log n. So you see that expected distance squared in a graph of polynomial growth grows um, at most like n log n. Now, he, this is true if we have a regular graph, if we have, so, so <coughs> this was if g is regular. But it still works with different constants in the general case of a, a simple graph uh, with no multiple edges. Uh, if you just plug in the uh, full Varopoulos current, you'll just change the constants. So even without regularity, it's still true that you have the expected distance squared grows at most n log n. Um, so in particular, so it's true for any graph of polynomial growth, it's particularly true if you have a subgraph of ZD, because that has polynomial growth. Um, in so just a little story about that. In 85, Harry Keston proved by a different method, the Martingale method, a variant of the veropoulos karn inequality. In fact, almost the same as Veropoulos had proved, but a with a different proof. So he also obtained such an inequality, and he asked for graphs of polynomial growth, specifically subgraphs of ZD, did you really need this log? Right, so it's a very natural question, and I must say that every year or two, someone asks me this question, so luckily I'm prepared with the answer. So if you have a subgraph of ZD, can you go faster on a subgraph than in ZD? Because you know that <coughs> In ZD, a random walk is diffusive, so the expected distance squared grows at most linearly in time. Can it grow faster in a subgraph? Usually when you pass to a subgraph, it slows things down. But the answer is it can grow faster, and this type of inequality is, is, is sharp. And uh, the example was provided in uh, 88 by uh, Barlow and Perkins. It's a similar idea to this stretch expander I showed you before, but that one is not fitting into ZD. So you take a, basically take a tree and stretch it more and more as you move out. And, uh, and then uh, they showed you can embed it even in Z2. So even though Z2 is a recurrent graph, so any subgraph is recurrent, you can still find a subtree inside Z2 where the random walk will move faster than um, on Z2 in the sense of expectation. Again, it's recurrent, so it returns to the starting point many times. But if you look at the expected distance or expected distance squared, it can grow faster. OK, any questions or comments? Yes? So for the speed there, we can just remove the expectation and take the um That's right. That's right. So, um, for the so there is a sub-additive ergodic theorem that says that uh, the, if you take the limit of xn over n without expectation, it almost surely exists and equals the same L. And there's a similar thing for entropy. So entropy can be seen as the expectation of the information. So you if you take a log of 1 over the probability to go in n steps from the identity to xn, um, so the entropy is just the expectation of this quantity. And so there's an almost sure limit. This will converge to this uh, Aves entropy H. <laughs> I should say that the, the equivalence we just saw between positive entropy and positive, positive asymptotic entropy and positive speed extends much further. Um, it's also equivalent to having non-constant bounded harmonic functions on the group and also equivalent to having a non-trivial tail for the random walk on the group. So there's four natural questions which are all equivalent. Positive speed, positive entropy, a, it's called non-trivial Poisson boundary, which is a existence of harmonic functions, 
that are bounded and non-constant, and finally trivial tails. So if we look at the sigma field generated by the walk from time, non-trivial tail. So if we look at the sigma field generated by the walk from time n plus 1 uh, on, and intersect over n, that sigma field is non-trivial. All these four things are equivalent. So this was understood in the 80s. Um, and you can find, again, one exposition of that in, in my book with Russ and other expositions in many papers of Kaimanovich that discuss this topic, and again, extensions in, in works of Anna and others. It might be good to mention, guys, that is here what you mentioned is true for any random walk, not only for simple random walk. And as okay. for the implication you explained, n positive implies uh, h positive. Um, it's it's true for any finitely supported, uh, not finitely supported. Any L one. Uh, to, to have a um, finite first moment, this is a result of Carlson and the Trappier, right? And the, their proof doesn't use at all Carnevaropoulos because if if the support is not finite, of course you you can't have. Uh, yeah. That's right, that's excellent. And one direction of this is uh, I was planning to give as an exercise, the other direction is uh, deeper. So, as a, so thank you, Anna. So, as, as Anna is saying, the equivalent h positive to a speed positive. So, this equivalence extends uh, to. To random walks on the group with the to random walks a, that with the long range jumps as long as uh, the expectation of one step is is fine is finite so so you don't need so we were discussing walks on a Cayley graph, where you walk to the neighbor, but you can jump far away. As long as the expected distance of the jump is finite, then the, uh, first of all, the, both of these limits exist, and, uh, and you still have the equivalence. So, so this is, uh, in general, uh, too hard for an exercise, but there is a, so, um, there's an exposition of <coughs> this. So this proof was simplified, and I'll forget all the citations. The proof of this equivalence was first proved in this generality by Carlson and Le Drapier. And uh, there's a simplified proof. I'm now uh, forgetting the author of the simplified proof. I'll remind myself. And, uh, and we do have an exposition of the simplified proof in the book with Russ of this general equivalence. But I want to just give you as an exercise the easy part here. So what is the exercise? So one is, so part one is show that finite speed implies, finite expectation x1 finite implies that h of x1 is finite. Okay, so if uh, uh, the expected distance you go to is finite, then also the entropy is, in one step, is finite. And then, uh, more generally, show that, uh, so what we obtained in this Cayley graph case, right, was that the entropy was bounded above by a constant multiple of the speed, so show the same thing in general, so, um, um, so little h is bounded by some constant that I'm going to allow to depend on the walk times um, the asymptotic speed. So note the different nature of the upper and the lower bound. The upper bound is linear, entropy is at most linear in the speed. The lower bound here is quadratic. Your constant is just the growth of, uh, of, of your group, right? Yes, yes. But I'm leaving this, so part of the exercise is to identify the constant. And to so th this, this direction is doable. Um, the other direction, bounding, so extending, extending this one, 
uh, again requires a different idea since the Veropoulos current is no longer no longer can be used. So this is a uh, different argument uh, by Carlson and Drapier. But I'm just giving as an exercise is the kind of easier direction here. Okay, how are we doing on time? Um, so, uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about lower bounds on speed. Since here, so one of the topics of the course is rate of escape. We talked here about upper bounds. What about lower bounds? So. So lower bounds on the rate of escape, random walks on groups, again, uh, finite and infinite. Um, so suppose G is a D regular graph if G is infinite then the expectation of the distance squared is at least n over d. And uh, I should say, yeah, so g is d regular. So d is the degree or the number of generators. If g is finite, then the expectation of xn squared is at least n over 2d for n which is less than the relaxation time. This constant half can be improved, but uh, I don't care. So note that in the finite case, right, so this inequality, expected distance squared grows like at least linearly, uh, so it holds in the infinite case. Obviously, it's not going to hold in the finite case forever because this remains bounded by the diameter squared of the group, and this is growing. So we're claiming it's true uh, until the relaxation time. Remember, the relaxation time is 1 over the spectral gap of the random walk. So one uh, open question, uh, does this hold in the finite case? Can you push this further? beyond the relaxation time, does it hold until the mixing time? So, so, uh, so here are some questions. What about until the mixing time? And I don't care about the constant uh, 2D. Can you prove some, something like that until the mixing time? Or you, the other thing you ask, how long could this happen? Maybe until the uh, until the uh, <coughs> diameter squared times the degree. So, so I find this a very interesting question. Both it has, uh, it would have great consequences if we understand this, but also philosophically, you're walking in a Cayley graph, and maybe you are getting a report of how far you are from the starting point, but you don't know really is the Cayley graph finite or infinite. So if you walk for long enough, eventually you'll see the walls closing in on you, 
and you'll feel claustrophobic and you won't be able to keep escaping. <coughs> but how long is that time? So certainly by the time your distance is the order of the diameter, you have to feel it. But you know, will you feel it much earlier? So how far can you push that lower bound? So the arguments we know only push it until the relaxation time which is a little paradoxical because if you take a graph like an expander <coughs> where the relaxation time is just order one, this inequality says nothing, but actually on an expander you know you move quite fast until you reach the diameter. So this inequality is kind of complementary to the ones coming from expansion. So, so it's great to have Anna here because these inequalities of a are actually re, uh, related coming to an uh, insight she had about using embeddings to bound speed. Um, and I'll say a little more about that. So, so there is another So, so let's look at the groups G of exponential growth. So an example that is the lamplighter, a nice example to think about is the lamplighter. on ZD. So let me remind you about the lamplighter group. So we have a base. <laughs> you saw it, the cycle in my lecture and you heard about it in Charles' lecture as well. But you could have any base. So for instance, if the base is ZD, you have at every site of ZD a lamp that can be on or off, one or zero. Only finitely many lamps are on. And you have a marker, a walker. And what the marker can do, it can flip the lamp where he is, or move to some neighboring, uh, neighboring node. Um, so these all have exponential growth, very easy to see, because by walking to this, you know, you can walk to distance n over 2 and turn on off n over 2 lamps. So these are good examples, but, uh, but for all groups of exponential growth, Veropoulos proved a nice bound, the probability to go from uh, the identity to x or to any, to go back to the identity, um, decays like at most a constant, uh, e to the minus constant n to the one third. Now this is sharp for uh, x equals e and the lamplighter on z. Okay, maybe. <coughs> Quick explanation why this is sharp. If I'm doing lamplighter walk on z, And you want to return, what's the identity of the lamplighter walk? It's just the, lamp, the marker is at the origin and all the lamps are off. So I start there and I want to return there in n steps. What's the most efficient way to do it? The most efficient way is to have the marker walk inside some fixed interval of length r, say, or 2r, say, from minus r, r, and only turn on lamps there. And then at the end of the interval, he will um, come back, turn off all the lamps, and come back to the identity. So what bound does that give us? That gives us Pn of EE. It's going to be at least, what is the chance of staying within an interval of length r? 
Well, at time r squared, it comes for free with constant probability. If I want to do it for time n, which is larger than r squared, it will cost me some n over r squared because I divide time into rounds of length r squared. In each round, I have a constant probability. So this is the probability of staying in the interval, so the marker that is walking. And at the end, as it's walking, we're going, it turns on some lamps. At the end, we want it to, in the last round, um, to turn off, turn off all the lamps there and go back to the identity. This we can easily get at a cost which is exponentially, exponential in R, right? If I wait, so I do this for, say, n minus 2R steps or 5R steps, and then the last 5R steps are devoted to carefully walking, finding all the on lamps, turning them off, and walking back to the origin. This, if you just force the walk to do that, in just 5R steps, it can be done, and the cost will be exponential in R. So to do that, okay? Because I just specify for 5R steps what I want the walk to do. This costs me exponential in R. Is this clear as a lower bound? Again, if something is unclear, tell me. Okay, so we, we want the walk to stay here. Each round is of length r squared. It's a constant probability. I want to do it for n over r squared rounds. And then I want at the last r steps to come back to the identity. And if you look at this, you want to maximize this so you will balance the two terms. So you'll choose r, which is n to the one third, to balance these two terms. And then you'll get e to the minus, you know, a different constant, n to the one third. Okay, so this shows on this lamplighter group such a lower bound. And the uh, Varopoulos theorem tells you that for groups of exponential growth, this is, this is sharp. What you can easily deduce from this is that the expected xn is going to be bigger than some constant times n to the one third. Okay, because uh, by time n, if you look at the ball of radius, tiny constant times n to the one third, you know each point there has very small probability. So, right? So take the so probability of x n You just basically multiply this probability by the volume, so e to the minus c n to the one third, times the volume, if you take the ball around the identity of radius, some small constant alpha times n to the one third. If you make this alpha small enough, this, will, this ball will grow slower than this factor, so this probability will be small, but this is an upper bound for the probability you are in this ball. So it means that uh, xn is going to be outside the ball. So using heat kernel bounds, this is kind of the best you can get. But but using embedding ideas, you get something better. So here I expressed it for the second moment, but one can actually uh, get it also for the first moment that the expectation of xn is at least constant root n. <coughs> so here one has to go against Cauchy-Schwartz, so there's a little, you know, there's some argument needed there. But we still don't know a way to get this from heat kernel type bounds, from transition probability bounds, because uh, we would this bound doesn't depend on where x is compared to the identity. So if we would want to get heat kernel bounds to improve this, we would need what's called better off-diagonal bounds, and these are not generally available. OK, so questions? 
Yes. So this bound is sharp for the monetary codes, uh, codes, but not for non-amenable codes? Uh, right. So for non-amenable groups, you always have positive speed. So zoom off at positive speed. Okay. So in so these questions I'm focusing now are interesting for amenable groups. Okay. So, but one strange thing is this inequality, ah, which I didn't uh, say. So, right. So I, I so so actually, thanks for the question. So this inequality is true um, for for the infinite case. It's true for G amenable. For G non-amenable, we have a stronger inequality of bigger than n squared times the constant, but only for large enough n. So it's actually open if this inequality for infinite groups holds for all groups at all times. So it's a very strange situation. We know it's true for amenable groups and even in the bigger class of non kashdan groups, but we don't know it for general groups um, at all times. But if the group is non-amenable, if you just wait long enough, it will be uh, expected distance squared will grow uh, quadratically. So I didn't uh, write that case, but um, but so so what's true in a general group is this is always true for n large enough. So I mean what I wrote here is always true for n large enough. But if I want, to, but for amenable groups, it's actually true for all n. Okay, from d is the degree, d is the degree, then the size of the generating set. And this is, I'm talking about the special case, just simple random walk. If the group is non amenable but without cash down, you don't have the same way. Yeah, the same thing I, I said, the same thing extends to non cash down also, even it's, if it's for all times. Uh, so I'm not defining this now, but uh, so this is. Um, <laughs> So these kind of proofs are based on an, a, an embedding, a embedding idea pointed out by Anna, uh, based on the mock theorem, and the, and the more direct proof was given later a Okay, so the embedding idea given by Anna. Well, it's not really my idea, as she said. It's very kind of you to cite me here. Well, I think it was your idea to, not the embedding, but the using it to derive speed was your idea. Not really. I have explained this once to Valent uh, Virus. Yes. Uh, Is Valent here? Uh, okay. Uh, so it, he explained me how to use it to extract the square root, what I did. Right, right, right. So, but uh, that's right. So, so, uh, so Anna first observed that how the mock embedding theorem gives a lower bound on the expected distance squared, and then which is what all I wrote up there. And then uh, Balin noted how you can use then a martingale facts to get a lower bound on the expected distance as well. And then there is a. a so, so Balin should be mentioned here as well. Um, and then uh, there is a paper uh, with James Lee that uh, gives uh, you know, more direct proofs. And an exposition of this story in, is also in the book with Russ. Again, not, in, not in the most general case. But, uh, and your question is for any group, uh, you so have exactly the same thing. So my question is. And Yes, exactly. With, with exactly no, no loss in constants. Yeah. For all n, is it true that for all n and for all Cayley graphs we have this inequality? We don't know. We, we do know it, of course, for large enough n, and we do know it for all n if it's non kashdan So only kashdan groups, uh, like you know, SL3z, remain uh, unknown for this. Okay, so. Um, all right, so I will. So I do uh, want to show you the, some uh, some proofs of this. So I will start now and go a little bit into the exercise session, and then we'll switch to actual exercises. So in the exercise session, you know, will be after uh, later this afternoon. Um, but 
let me at least start in explaining uh, the embedding ideas behind this proof. So, where is the... So here is a lemma <coughs> from this uh, So take g, which is finite or infinite, and let f be a real function in L2 of g. So if, uh, if we're in a finite group, I just mean a function, real valued function on g. Uh, if an infinite group, we're assuming that it's in L2, with respect to just the sum of squares, no weights. Okay? So let f in L2 of g, and let's define the Dirichlet form of f. It can be written as some uh, Pn xy and so this is the Dirichlet form of f with respect to the n step uh, Markov chain and you can also so if you expand the square here um, right, so you'll get a, actually I want a half. So this is this inner product in L2 of G, and this you can, this is a classical two representation of the Dirichlet form. So if you take here and expand the square, right, if you sum this, uh, you write this, right, so you get fx squared plus fy squared minus 2fxy. So if you sum the terms with the fx squared, you'll just get f times f. If you sum the terms with the fy squared, again, you'll get f times f because we are in a symmetric walk. So, it, so if you take the sum with x or with y, you'll get the same thing. So that's how you get the i times ff. And then the last term, the 2fxy, so the 2 cancels with this half. And then when you sum this with fxy, and because of the pnxy, you'll just get p to the nff. So this is a two representation of the Dirichlet form. And then the, the lemma. is that the expected distance squared from the identity is always bigger than 1 over the degree times um, d1 dn of f over d1 of f. Uh, yes, so this is for random walk on a group. So G is n not just a general graph. So this is for, for random walks on groups. So, <coughs> so this is all in this setting, a deregular Cayley graph. Okay, and in the last, uh, uh, last uh, minute, I want to explain at least, so this will be the lemma, but let me explain how in the finite case, it uh, gives the inequality we want. So, so if g is finite, right, so then there is, you take an eigenfunction for p corresponding to the second eigenvalue. So lambda is lambda 2. Okay, so this will be the right function to plug in. So what is dn of f in this case? Okay, 
okay, let's, let's take f to be normalized in L2. Why not? So then this will just give you a 1 minus lambda to the n. This is just 1 over d, 1 minus lambda to the n over 1 minus lambda. Okay, so the lemma is this statement, the lemma holds for any choice of f, as long as it's not constant, so the, the denominator is not 0. Okay, so I didn't say f is not constant. I, uh, to remember that I'm in France, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so f is not constant. So we're assuming, in other words, d1 is not 0. <coughs> um, right, so we have this, which we can write as the sum 1 over d times the sum of lambda a to the j. But in the finite case, we assume that uh, lambda is, we assume that n is less than t rel. It's 1 over, uh, less than 1 over 1 minus lambda. So that, um, So this means that this is bigger than 1 over d sum 1 minus 1 over n to the j. And uh, this is in Right, so lambda is bigger than uh, bigger than one over n, and uh, okay, and and now we're completely elementary, but you know, in particular, this is bigger. Uh, so I won't give the sharpest arithmetic calculation, but this is bigger than one minus j over n, which is then bigger than. So if you sum these things, it will be bigger than uh, n over two d can get the constants a little better, but this is good, for, good enough. Okay, so that's, so, I'll exp so in the beginning of the exercise session, I'm going to steal some of it to explain the, just the proof of this, uh, of this lemma, and then we'll have a complete proof, at least for the finite case of the inequality. And uh, then we'll discuss exercises. Thank you. Question, but bound, the yes. fact that the bound is better for infinite. Yes. Because, can't you have the same bound at least for a certain amount of time in finite case? You mean, so you, you're worried about the two. Yes. Uh, you can improve the two, but I don't know actually how to improve it to one. So you can replace it by like one minus one over e or something like that. But Even for shorter time frame? For short. <laughs> The shorter the time, the better the constant, but they can't actually s get it to 1. Um, uh, I do, but in this connection, I do want to mention one, uh, one more exercise, sorry, since <laughs> you asked. So here's an exercise. Show that for, a, for G, which is a Cayley graph, uh, the relaxation time is at most uh, a constant times, so uh, let me write a specific constant 5, you can do better, times the diameter squared times the degree. Okay, so again, it says some diffusive upper bound. The relaxation time is at most is at most this. This is true for any 
a Cayley graph and more generally it's true for any transitive graph. Uh, and this is very classical, I think first proved by Babai in 91. So I should give credit this type of bound. And, and uh, many other, many proofs exist. So we really know it's true. But uh, it's open question whether the same holds for T mix instead of T rel. And again, I don't care if you replace the five by a million, but a constant times diameter squared times degree, it's a conjecture of mine that this is always an upper bound for mixing time in any Cayley graph or any transitive graph. And it's open for mixing time, it's classical for relaxation time. Okay, thank you. <laughs>